Welcome to View from the North. And today we're going to talk about transportation, modern transportation in Canada with our old friend, Dr. Ken Rogers. Welcome to the show, Ken. Well, hi, Jay. Uh, when you use the word modern transportation, I'm not too sure that Canada would uh, meet a reasonable standard for modern. I mean, if you say modern is something that works, everything in Canada works pretty well, but compared to much of the world, uh, uh, Canada's transportation system, which I think of as the way you move people and the way you move uh, materials or products, uh, is certainly not uh, the best in the world. Um, you know, the United States is, is better than Canada in some areas and about the same pathetic level as Canada in uh, some others. Now, we do have a certain pathetic quality about transportation in the U.S. Uh, in Hawaii, we, we've we been having the war on potholes for 20, 30 years now, and we're losing that war. Um, I'm not sure how confident I am about the airline industry. I suppose a lot of people overseas, a lot of countries buy American manufactured airlines, but gee, uh, some of them don't work as well as we want. And I'm not sure about the trucking industry. You know, one of the largest uh, truckers in in the uh, in the country just filed bankruptcy after getting a, a bailout of seven hundred million dollars uh, from the Biden administration. I, I could go on. Uh, I mean, I think there are real problems, but I like to I like to add another ingredient in the soup of our discussion. Okay, so and I watch a lot of YouTube, and on YouTube these days, it's quite remarkable. Uh, how many documentaries and interesting movies are posted. It's not like just for the kids. It's not social media. It's real documentaries, and and they select it for you, and then you can see mm, anything in the world. So mm, my wife and I stumbled onto one the other day, and she likes to watch things about Japan. This was about Japan. They knew that. Um, and, they, and they gave us a, a, a movie, a documentary of a couple who took the ferry from Fukuoka, which is, I guess, near the northern end of Japan, um, to Busan, which is at the southern end of South Korea. Brand new ferry. It was beautiful, and it was cheap. And it was a three-hour ride in, in total luxury. And it was for the people. I mean, it was, it was uh, so comfortable, uh, so accommodating to the passengers, um, and a beautiful, you know, piece of marine equipment. They call it the beetle. It looks like a big beetle. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this thing was like an eye-opener. It was revelationary to think that these days, now, uh, Japan is building and using and deploying ferries like this on an international basis. It was impressive. Okay, then later in the same trip, the same couple uh, takes a train, and this train um, goes uh, south through Japan. And it is a speed train, as so many trains in Japan are, like in France, for example. You know, you remember the TJV, the, the, the train of grande vitesse of great speed, you know? Um, <clears throat> so, of course, Japan has great speed trains. So does China these days. But this train, uh, for the couple, for a two-day trip, 6,000 American. And what is that? 3,000 a piece, fifteen hundred per day per per person. Okay, and with this, you get the most incredible five star luxury on this train. That's why it's so expensive. The meals, the the wine, the food, the accommodation in every way, shape, or form. And I say to myself, there is no train in the United States or possibly anywhere in the world that beats this Japanese train. Um, so, uh, oh, and they, and they have side trips. It's like a cruise ship, you know? You stop at a given city or town, and the buses, which are also beautiful, wait for you and then take you around and give you a tour. And then you come back and get back on the train, and it goes to the, the next stop. So I'm saying, now, that these guys understand transportation. I think Japan always understood transportation of this kind. They were ahead. They were the... I think they were the first one with the high-speed train, maybe France, but maybe Japan. 
and now um, the, the ferry um, and the and this very luxurious train. So I'm saying to myself, what are we missing here? Not only do we not have that in the U.S. and I suppose in Canada, but we don't even dream about it. We don't even know about it. Uh, in, in Hawaii, we we have this kind of uh, um, this kind of problem with ferries. We have a, a ferry complex. We 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 threw out the ferry that was servicing us, which was very good, and we have never considered another one to replace it. And we don't have a ferry, and we won't have a ferry because it's radioactive, politically radioactive. Um, so I guess um, that has to be included in the porridge of our discussion. How does that does that change your answer in any way? Not really. Uh, you know, when you come to ferries. Uh, you know, British Columbia has a uh, a huge island uh, called Vancouver Island, which is on you know on the Pacific side of uh, of Canada, and it has about seven hundred and fifty thousand people on it, and it's um, not unlike uh, near Seattle. There's tons of islands, uh, you know, some of which are American and some of which are Canadian, and the ferries run you know, between these islands, you know, in many ways without regard to which country you're in. Um, and um, those ferries are, you know, nice and reasonable, but they're not, you know, the latest in the world, and they're not as good as, uh, you know, some countries. Uh, you know, it, it, it's much like, you know, whether you take railroad and say, well, you know, the British built railroads in Pakistan and India more than 100 years ago, and they haven't maintained them since. And uh, and you can see them on television, and they look pretty pathetic. You know, the Canadian railroads were built probably before those. You know, but, but every so often they, you know, replace the road bed or the rail bed, and they replace the rails, and they do this, and they do that, and the Canadian railroads are not perfect, but they're nothing like the train that runs from, you know, Tokyo to Sapporo, or Tokyo to Osaka uh, in Japan, or the one that runs from Busan to Seoul in Korea, or the ones that run all over in Europe. Um, you know, you can take, you know, the next type of thing, pick commuter trains. You know, Canada has, uh, you know, commuter trains uh, near Toronto, uh, and they're about the same league as uh, the Long Island Railroad or, you know, the railroad, the rails that run from, you know, the suburbs of New York into New York City. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, they're just really not like, like, you know, even the British railroad in in the UK, all of the railroads are better than than the ones in Canada. Uh, now we have two spectacular railroads. If you're talking about you know owning shares in the stock market, uh, but uh, you know, and they you know are world scale in terms of their sheer size you know, how many million miles of railroad tracks they have. But, you know, they don't go very fast and, you know, they're, you know, far from perfect. Uh, now they at least have pretty good maintenance. Like you can think of that uh, railroad accident on the Ohio-Pennsylvania border a few months ago. Uh, now there was a, that was not something, even though people search hard to say, you know, there were negligent maintenance or negligent this or negligent that. And it just wasn't there. I mean, you had a wheel bearing that, that wore out and, and overheated and and uh, and between monitoring stations, it wasn't uh, signaled quickly enough before the train had derailed. Now, you can say, well, gee, uh, you could have, you know, maybe they should have a little better standard. Now, I don't know if that standard of electronic maintenance uh, uh, is as good as the ones in Japan or Korea or the many new railroads that, that China's built, but but it kind of gives the, the, you know, lay of the land. 
Like you use the potholes in Hawaii. Well, a good way to describe, you know, the Canadian or American problem is, you know, if you think of the potholes, there's a good way to describe why do you have potholes is that in the United States, there are about 285 million small vehicles, like automobiles or trucks or little wee pickup trucks, like trucks that are vehicles that have just two axles and four wheels, reasonably small. Well, so what you really have is about one and a third of vehicles for every person that's um, old enough to drive. Uh, now, in Canada, we're not quite as bad. It's 1.2, you know, but the only reason for that is is we have more people over 65 and less under uh, 16 than the U.S. does, <laughs> as opposed to what, what the people in the middle really are doing. It's about the same. Well, you know, you can say, well, it's now the roads are a complaint in every city in Canada and in the U.S. Traffic people complain about in every city in Canada and the U.S. You know, we have some that are much better than others, but, but uh, you know, and some that are really terrible. However, the underlying key problem is that the individual you know, have more money to buy more cars than the public that who is responsible to do roads has money for the roads. Now, if you want a good comparison between Canada and the U.S., where the U.S. looks wonderful, is is Eisenhower in night in you know about 1960 or whatever it was. Not long after World War II, anyhow, when he was president, they did the interstate highway system in the United States. And ever since then, the United States has paid the U.S. federal government, the one that has all the money, or the best taxing power, more taxing power than they have responsibility to spend. They will pay for 90% of any of these interstate highways. Things and there's no special new negotiation every time you do, you know, something on one of these interstate highways. Now they're not perfect. Like you can look at that bridge in uh, Cincinnati that crosses the Ohio River. That's that's made lots of publicity because Biden and and, uh, and the uh, you know Mitch Mitch, 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 yeah. Yeah, the the opposing party, you know, at least could have a toast because of that bridge finally getting starting to get it fixed, you know, and way past when it was due. Um, so, but that interstate highway system includes going through cities. Now, if you you pick in Canada, the, you know, there's let's say the Trans Canada Highway is about the only what you'd call interstate highway that the federal government had anything to it. And or interprovincial. Well, the minute they get to a city, they stop paying. You know, so so you'll have this nice highway zoom up to a huge city like Calgary and Alberta, or I call a million and a half people, a pretty huge city. You know, and and suddenly the road sucks. I mean, it just is terrible to get through the city. You know, my my wife and I were traveling in France, La Belle France. And uh, we were mm, I don't know, 30 miles outside of Paris. All of a sudden, the road went down um, in a, into a tunnel, subterranean road now. And it, it went on and on and on for 30 miles, all underground. And then it came up right in the center of Paris. We didn't have to go through the suburbs or, you know, any of the environs. Uh, we just came up, and, and there was the Arc de Triomphe right in front of us. That's the way to go. You you bypass all of the traffic areas that way. Well, but my point was, who pays? You know, and and in Canada, you'd have, oh, well, not me. 
you know, and not my neighbor and not nobody wants to pay, you know, and the only government with enough money to do so, you know, is the feds and they don't have, they don't have near the scale of financing proportionally to what the French government has. Like European governments have way more taxes than Canada does. Mm -hmm. And Canada has more than the U.S. does. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, I mean, it's surprising you got any roads at all. <laughs> you know, where, no, the and, and our from provinces vary. For example, our our wealthiest province is Alberta, and they have beautiful roads running, you know, from nowhere to somewhere of lesser importance. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they got little wee, you know, urban areas with a wonderful paved road. Now, the the two big cities in Alberta, you know, uh, have um, uh, much better road transportation than other cities in Canada, but still, it's it's not. It's much like your pothole example. It's it's far from from appropriate, especially because that's the only mode of transportation. You know the the you know uh, like the well, those two cities have light rail transportation, and the one in Calgary carries more passengers than almost any LRT system in North America. But, um, you know, it's certainly not um, really, really speedy. Um, no, it's better than, let's say, I was on a train from um, the Newark airport to downtown Manhattan, you know, and and it wobbled, the whole carriage wobbled back and forth sideways as if, you know, the roadbed was not at all level and, you know, it creaked and grunted and groaned all the way there, and the and the carriage looked like it was something that, uh, you know, the Europeans uh, sold secondhand uh, fifty years ago. Let me uh, offer some thoughts about that. I I, I remember in the eighties, uh, possibly the early nineties, a fellow named uh, Spencer Abram was the um, he was the energy uh, the energy secretary in the U.S. And there was a big uh, blackout in the northeast part of the country, large blackout. And they came to him and they said, Spencer, you know, what's wrong with you? How come you couldn't avoid this? Uh, how come the, uh, you know, the energy infrastructure uh, was so deficient and decrepit uh, that, you know, we had this blackout? Uh, why didn't you do something? And he said, and I will never forget this, he said, you, know, you, you really have it wrong. Um, you can't build the interstate road system and, and never update it. You can't do that. It gets old. You have to keep on updating these all these systems, use the best technology. And they do that in, in Europe to a large extent. And they do that in Japan, other parts of Asia, Korea, for example, because, you know, there's, they start from zero. <laughs> so whatever they do is new. Okay? And China, the same thing. The other, the other thought I was going to, uh, you know, suggest to you is that transportation, you know, we, we have mismanaged transportation, and it sounds like, you know, the U.S. and Canada are in roughly the same place. We've mismanaged it because we haven't understood the lesson of Spencer Abram. But more than that, it is a, a canary in the coal mine. It is a metric of what we think of our community society, uh, what we think of getting along and getting together. I mean, one of the great lessons that I learned from uh, Bogota, Colombia, I told you before, is that the, these people, investors, it's private, um, have decided that building roads into the hinterland is a way to connect the country, bring government to people, people to government, and make a, you know, a collective country better for everyone. Okay, so transportation is so critical for the, the country in general whatever society it is. And we don't understand that. We don't do that. Finally, last point, and I'll let you respond to me, is technology. You know, every time there's an accident with an autonomous vehicle, the, the media goes wild and says, we shouldn't allow this. We have to have a congressional hearing. We have to stop everything until we figure it out. No more autonomous vehicles, not only cars, but trucks. But the future, I suggest, Ken, is autonomous everything. 
Um, you know, it's more efficient for fuel. Uh, it's more efficient for getting the right the right uh, route. It's more efficient for the way the roads are used and the way they've deteriorated. Um, so autonomous vehicles are coming, and that includes airplanes. Um, and you know, there are a lot of airplanes. Interestingly enough, uh, made in China, you can buy a kit. You can buy an airplane kit from Costco, big kit, huge kit, and in your backyard, you can take the kit apart and make a little airplane out of it. Now, there's no software to, you know, to keep you from colliding or anything, but that's coming. What I'm there's, saying is that we have to keep up with technology on transportation. Well, there's no rules of the sky. <laughs> well, it, think about it's, drones. It, no, yes, well, drones are obvious. I mean, you had gyro, you've had gyrocopters for a long time. You know, but one um, area of transportation where the U.S. is, is really good is pipelines. You know, the, the, now I tend to think that the maintenance on some of those pipelines may really be suffering. However, you know, their you know pipeline system in the U.S. is really efficient. Uh, if of all the areas of transportation, that's probably the one where, relative to the U.S., Canada looks worse. Mm -hmm. You know, the worst um, comparatively. Uh, you know, but um, we have a variety of domestic reasons why that's so. I mean, the U.S. basically thinks of uh, energy security, it, you know, with its economic side is really key, where Europe and Canada took the same position of, uh, oh, well, hurrah, rah, rah for the environment and to heck with uh, anything else, kick energy, you know, any way you can. And, uh, you know, Europe's sucking air because of it. Canada's economically not doing as well as they should because of it. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, the difference is there where, you know, that some countries want to throw rocks at the U.S. saying, well, you just are Pump it out in you know oil and gas like crazy while the world needs it. Well, it is very interesting that you talk about that because if we are really to address climate change, we have to um, deploy um, electric vehicles not only in one place but all places of the world. Um, and you know the U.S. Uh, creates a lot of greenhouse gases. I guess so does Canada, but not as much. And, uh, you know, what, what's happening is that the oil and gas interests are really standing in the way, as they have been for decades, of electric vehicles. The only way to deal with this huge amount of greenhouse gas uh, is to make everybody use an electric vehicle. And I feel that the efforts in this country are really limp. Um, you know, if you were king of the universe and you wanted to deal with climate change, which is presenting itself every day now, and in, in tougher and tougher ways, um, you know, you would you'd start out with the car and you'd make every car electric vehicle. And you'd make well, an electric vehicle right now, not next year, not five or 10 years away. I don't really think that automobiles are the worst. I mean, I tend to think of international shipping. You know, these, these large boats, uh, you know, they're using bunker fuel. And I mean, they're to talk about you know, the most um, non-environmental of all of the uh, oil and gas products, um, you know, where, you know, I would think of um, a lot of things that, that I would do, you know, for climate change uh, before I would be kicking the oil and gas industry. Like in Canada, the oil and gas companies are at the forefront of, of installing you know, wind farms and, and solar farms. Um, and, um, you know, they're on a world comparative basis. Uh, the oil and gas industry is probably the cleanest. Uh, you know, it's certainly better than the U.S. And the U.S. is better than, than anywhere else in the world that I'm aware of in terms well, of oil and gas standards. You know, we have political considerations and considerations of investors and corporate interests and all that. Um, but to save the planet, um, we have to do it all at the same time right now. 
Um, right. that, that's my view. I, I mean, we, you know, I, you may not agree fully. Okay. Uh, after all, you well, were originally from Alberta, uh, which is, uh, you know, an <laughs> oil and gas place. I understand, Ken. <laughs> but deep, deep, deep in my heart, I, I have this, uh, uh, you know, unconscious uh, favor of the oil and gas industry. Is that what you're trying to tell me? <laughs> well, well, similar to the uh, to the bunker fuel, you know, problem of international shipping. You have the creation of of power. Well, you you say electric vehicles, we've got to have all electric vehicles, or where the hell are you going to get the electricity? You see, you can't like China. What what are they doing? They're pumping out, you know, one new major coal power plant every month, or more often than that. Like great big plants. You know, now they could do nuclear, they could do all kinds of things. They're just sucking air for the need to have more electricity. Well, you know, North America, our, you know, newest power, let's call it uh, economic problem in Canada or the U.S., is we both need to generate an awful lot more electricity than we are to deal with the stuff that's coming down the pipe, of which electric cars are a significant one, you know, but, you know, your um, transportation of goods, you know, you get on it and, you know, go on any U.S. interstate highway and, and, or on, you know, the Canadian highways that travel between any major city, and you know what percentage are eighteen wheelers? You know a big percentage, and and you know those are diesel, not just gasoline. You know today they're diesel. Diesel. Well, when are they going to be electrified? Nobody's pushing that at the same pace that they're pushing electric cars. It's it's you know you've got to take the whole bundle. Like a, when I was saying the U.S. had a smarter policy than Europe in terms of energy in general, because you were saying energy security should come first, you know, and that, and I think that, uh, you know, the way you blindly, I'll, I'll, I'll just pick on you to say blindly said, you know, electric vehicles are the be all and end all, you know, like Trump can exaggerate or stretch what somebody said, I suppose I can too. Um, the um, I don't think that that's the total picture. Well, I think all these uh, all these things are connected. Uh, energy and transportation yeah. takes a lot of energy to run transportation, wherever you get it from. In fact, it takes a lot of energy to run an economy. A, a country that has plentiful and relatively cheap energy has got a much better chance of, of having a good economy. And a country that has good transportation has a much better chance of having a better economy. And the problem is, are are we doing the right thing in public policy and in making you know demands on our individuals and our businesses um, to get on board with developing cheap energy and clean energy, uh, and for the, the same in the same way, developing uh, transportation for everyone? And the the answer, in my view, is generally no. Although I agree with you that Europe is more conscious of this issue. And I don't know really where Asia fits. I know where China fits, um, but Japan tries hard, and I think Korea tries hard. Uh, bottom line is, um, um, I think Canada and the U.S. are out of parity. You can disagree with me. Near the bottom of the, of the <laughs> pack and on some issues, that's correct. But but on uh, you know on the concept of of a, a nice balance of, ec, you know, the energy security and and its interplay with, or it is the basis of all economics, uh, or most economics. Um, that um, the U.S. has a better policy than Europe or Canada um, or China. You know, now Japan and South Korea. Um, you know, have a problem that uh, they just don't happen to have very many sources of energy, you know, and they had 
Fukushima, uh, and, and uh, you know, you're looking at, uh, they also had uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you know, so you'd say, um, you know, what should they do? So they're crying for LNG or liquid natural gas, uh, and the U.S. has stepped up to the plate in terms of energy security worldwide. You know, but why did the U.S. do it? It may be because, you know, your cynical way to say, oh, well, the greedy oil and gas industry pushed and so they could pump out more gas from the U.S. and ship it off to South Korea and Japan. You know, well, Canada is so stupid. You know, our natural gas, uh, we've been sending it to the U.S., who's sending it to ports, converting it to LNG, and sending it to Korea, Japan, China, and anybody else that'll take it, you know, and 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 getting more than half of the value out of doing that. We haven't really even touched the subject here today, honestly, because if you go through your own life and the transportation you take or don't take, um, and the changes that are uh, visible around us, um, we need we need to really address this because, it, as you said, energy and transportation are central to the development of global economy. At a time, Ken, and I'm so sorry, um, I, I, but we'll find. I know we'll find something else to discuss next time. Don't you? <laughs> don't you think so? <laughs> Thanks very much, Ken Rogers, Dr. Bye Ken Rogers in Kelowna, Canada. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.